today we're going to talk about hair color bias in keratinized matrices for drug testing. We're going to talk about uh, how drugs and metabolites are incorporated into hair. We're going to discuss the limitations of hair testing. We're going to discuss the anatomy of nail and nail formation. We're going to discuss the advantages of nail testing, how drug and drug metabolites are incorporated incorporated into nail, and then we'll uh, have a few examples of comparisons of hair and nail in the literature as they relate to hair color. Hair testing has been around for several decades. Uh, as you can see from this diagram, uh, uh, the, the, the drug is incorporated into the hair, and then once you cut the hair, um, uh, the drugs are trapped in the keratinized proteins and is available for us to extract out and analyze. Uh, hair testing has a number of advantages. It's a relatively simple, rapid, non-invasive collection. Uh, you don't have to have any privacy issues or male or female staff for collections. It yields a long window of exposure, 90 days, sometimes even longer. And even though hair testing is generally more expensive uh, than other specimen types, if you back it down to the number of dollars per day of information that you're getting, um, it really comes out to a very economical dollar per day uh, 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 ratio. Uh, hair is easy to ship and store. It's not a biological hazard, so that reduces a lot of the requirements for shipping and for storage. And at the laboratory, we're stored in room temperature, so those uh, costs are not passed along to the user. Uh, hair is relatively simple to analyze. Um, depending on your background, uh, hair is much easier to deal with than, say, you know, tissues from post-mortem type uh, 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 fields, and uh, those can be extremely difficult to extract. Hair is dry, you grind it up, you extract it, and off you go. And again, there's no known infection risk. So a number of var uh, uh, variables here are advantageous for conducting hair testing. How do drugs get into hair? First and foremost, we have environmental exposure. If you're in an environment where a drug is being smoked, handled, distributed, cut, cooked, etc., that drug will contaminate the environment, which includes you. And so we're talking about a physical transference of the drug itself to your hair. Now your hair is porous, and uh, the drug gets on your hair, it works into the nooks, crannies, and pores, binds to the proteins and pigments, and is available to be harvested and analyzed immediately. Route number two is the sweat and the oil from the scalp. As these fluids bathe the hair shaft, they contain drug and drug metabolite. As they bathe the hair shaft, they deposit the drug and drug metabolite uh, onto the hair. Once again, it works its way into the nooks, crannies, and pores, binds to the proteins and pigments, and is available to be harvested and analyzed. We begin seeing that drug show up a few hours following the dose. Route number three, and this is what most people think about with a hair test. Uh, the blood traveling through the root deposits drug and drug metabolite and uh, incorporates itself into the uh, forming hair. And once it emerges past the scalp line, which takes about two weeks, uh, it is available to be harvested and analyzed at that point. Now what we have at the end of the day are three extremely different modes of incorporation superimposed on top of each other. So it's a very complex picture. So we're not able to backtrack and determine time, doses, and frequency. There's just too many variables. Once it's incorporated, it begins to slowly leach out due to normal daily hygiene and exposure to the elements. So for most drugs, there is a, a defined timeline that we'll be able to find a detectable amount of drug. And just like any other specimen type that we encounter in the laboratory, uh, hair has limitations. And we need to appreciate those limitations when we're trying to interpret the results uh, for our clients. First and foremost, uh, bleaching, perming, dyeing, chemical straightening, or just cosmetic treatment. All of these processes contain varying amounts of either reducing or oxidizing agents. And depending on the drug, the hair color, the type of treatment, the extent of the treatment, it can affect the drug uh, concentrations in the hair. 
A good example was described back in 2001 uh, by Tanaka. Um, he described that methane plus um, hydrogen peroxide uh, resulted in a host of hydroxy products. Um, we are not looking for these hydroxy products, and neither do our amino assays look for these hydroxy products. And so the uh, likelihood of achieving a negative strain of confirmation is increased. Uh, we're familiar with hydrogen peroxide as far as bleaching goes, but what most people don't consider is that many of the hair dye preparations will contain varying amounts of hydrogen peroxide. So we have to consider all cosmetic treatments. Another one is the chemical relaxer. Uh, when I was at the Society of Hair Testing a couple of years ago in Toronto, I had the opportunity to see a presentation by Dr. Pritchett, and she presented uh, in, uh, 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 her, her findings at the Society of Hair Testing meeting and then later published it in the uh, Journal of Analytical Toxicology uh, last year. Um, and she had some very interesting findings on the effects of, of using chemical relaxer. First, I did not realize that chemical relaxers or hair straightening or processing hair, I didn't understand that they came in two, um, in two types. There's one that contains lye and one that does not contain lye. And so she presented information uh, using the um, uh, cocaine, PCP, and marijuana uh, with fortified samples, and she showed the results of uh, treated hair versus non-treated hair. And as you can see, um, the untreated hair had significant levels of cocaine, PCP, and marijuana, but the treated with the lye preparation, let's see if I can move my arrow here. So uh, if you can notice that the, the samples that were treated with the lye-based hair relaxer, the numbers are very much lower as a result of that treatment. And with the non-lye, um, it also had a very reducing effect on the concentration. So any hair that's cosmetically treated, we have to be aware that um, you know these particular samples, most of the compounds um, were were reduced significantly. These were above the cutoff, but we have to be aware that that if someone was just above the cutoff, these treatments will not the concentration down below the cutoff. Now the previous table showed fortified samples. Now these were authentic specimens. These were hair specimens from users from users of cocaine. And we looked at the, well she looked at the untreated um, results and we see uh, significant amounts of, of cocaine and, and, and cocaine metabolite. And then it was a very, oops, pardon me. We got a significant reduction of the cocaine and metabolites with the lye and a significant reduction with the non-lye. And so we got even more of an effect with authentic hair specimens. So at the end of the day, there is a catch-22 with these cosmetic treatments. Bleaching, perming, dotting, and other cosmetic treatments will cause drug to degrade in the hair if it's already in the hair. On the catch-22 is, is that these processes damage the hair. They make the hair more porous. They open the pores up wider. And so from that point forward, you can actually load more drug into the hair. And then coincidentally, or uh, yeah, that once that happens with the larger pores, more drug can be washed out through regular hygiene. So it's a very complex picture once you involve cosmetic treatment into the uh, equation. So hair color is one of the biggest variables in hair testing. And we're going to go over some data here from the literature, and some of this is quite old. This study here was from 1996. And what they did was they give coating to white, brown, and black rats. And they gave them 40 milligrams per kilogram on a daily basis for five days. And then they sampled the hair from each of these rats and tested them for coating. The white rats had 980 picograms. The brown rats had 5,900. And the black rat had 111,000 picograms per milligram of coating in their hair. Um, 
the reason for this is that one of the variables of the hair color that influences the concentration is the amount of pigment or melanin. And the more melanin in the hair, the more drug can bind and the tighter it binds. But what was completely amazing to me is I would not have expected such a huge difference between the brown rat and the black rat. I would have assumed if I was guessing the results, there would be a more even uh, distribution of these concentrations. But there is a large disparity between the brown hair and the black hair as far as coating goes. Now here's a second study by Slauson back in 1996. And this is a unique experiment in that instead of using different animals, we used animals that had both white and black hair on the same animal. That way uh, each animal is taking in 12 milligrams per kilogram daily and so that normalizes perhaps any metabolism differences or feeding differences or dosing differences or what have you. Um, so this normalized for a lot of variation here. So it's the same animal that did this for five days. They collected hair from the uh, non-pigmented sections of the animal and the uh, dark pigmented sections of the animal. And again, we got an incredible distribution of results. So when you call into the lab and, and you're asking uh, me or one of my colleagues here, uh, based on this number, is this person taking their prescription as, as described? Well, you know, one of the, you know, 500 versus 14,000, that is such a huge difference. So just knowing that hair color makes such a big difference, and, and in our demographic here in the U.S., we have every possible type of hair type and hair color, it's practically impossible to come up with some sort of a paradigm to say that um, under this situation, this kind of number represents uh, a certain type of usage. So you've heard me say this a million times if you guys are calling in and talking to me. Anytime you're testing a reservoir matrix or matrix where things tend to accumulate, we're, or we are not able to backtrack and determine time, dosage, and frequency. There's too many variables, and here is one of the biggest variables uh, that you will encounter. So talking about rat hair is one thing, but we're, we obviously test humans, and uh, do these observations carry forward uh, uh, into human hair. And here is a, a good study that, um, that was published back in 2004, and they were looking at uh, individuals that were given 10 milligrams daily of zolpidem. You know this is ambient. And um, so they did that for three days. And these individuals had uh, salt and pepper hair or grizzled hair. And so you had dark hair and you had gray hair. So they collected the hair and they separated out the specimens by color and analyzed them. And look, we saw the same uh, observation here. The non-pigmented hair had 0.4 picograms per milligram of zolpidem, and the black hair had 39. So that's an 80-fold difference in concentration based on the color. And this is from the same individual taking the same doses for the same period of time. Huge difference in the concentration that we find. Here's another study that was presented here in Des Plaines uh, back in 2004 when we hosted the uh, Society of Hair Testing. Uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Rawlings, and then he uh, also published some of this data in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology in 2003. But here we looked at several uh, donors that were characterized by their hair color, black, brown, dishwater blonde, and red. And each subject was given 30 milligrams uh, by mouth uh, three times daily for five days, and they collected that hair out over seven weeks following the dosage. And then they analyzed the first 1.5 inches each time they collected. And what they found was that according to hair color, as expected, uh, we had a wide range of concentrations. So black hair at 1,000 uh, picograms, brown hair at 250, dishwater blonde at 119, and red hair at 66. So these are individuals that were all given the same dose um, over the same period of time, the collections were made at the same time, and look at the wide range of concentrations that we see there. So with these alkaline compounds, which includes methamphetamine, cocaine, the opiates, which is heroin, hydrocodone, codeine, morphine, hydromorphone, oxycodone, 
uh, in PCB, we have to be aware that hair color is a large variable when it comes to the reporting concentration. And they further analyzed each specimen for the concentration of melanin, which is the pigment. And if you'll notice, the concentration on the left is the concentration of coating found, and the x-axis along the bottom is the total melanin concentration. And as the concentration of melanin goes up, the concentration of coating goes up, and it follows that uh, best fit line rather well which is uh, further characterized by the R squared value of 0.73, which is a very strong uh, uh, size effect for the concentration of melanin versus concentration of coating. That's a very strong correlation or association. Um, in layman's terms, you can think of this that 73% of the coating concentration is explained by the concentration of the pigment there. So that's a very strong variable. Other limitations, you guys are collecting hair, you know a lot of people come in and uh, there's very limited hair. Uh, you have gentlemen with hardly any hair at all and, um, and, and you have women with, uh, uh, with significant hairstyles that are not wanting to have them messed up, maybe they're expensive hairstyles. And so, you know, what can we do about that? Well, an alternative to this is, is hair is, uh, is using fingernail. Now one of the nice things about fingernail is that it does not have pigment. And so with the absence of the pigment, we have just removed one of the largest variables of hair testing. But first let's look at the anatomy of the nail. The nail forms in a place called the germinal matrix. There's a lot of blood flow there and drug is incorporated from the blood at that point. You have the skin surrounding the cuticle the nail and so the sweat and the oil from that. You also have environmental exposure. Uh, so all three mechanisms that we're familiar with with hair uh, is also present with the fingernail. One additional variable is that as the nail travels along the nail bed, there's a lot of capillary blood flow under that nail. You can see that if you pinch down on your nail it'll turn white and snap back to pink once you release the pressure. A lot of blood flow under there. And as that nail grows out to the distal edge, not only is that nail growing in length, but it's growing in thickness. And so nails are growing in two different directions, length and thickness. And you can review a lot of information in a review paper uh, in clinical pharmacokinetics from an uh, article back in 2000. Fingernails grow in length, approximately 0.1 millimeters per day. Toenails grow approximately 0.03 millimeters per day, so somewhat slower. But they are also forming ventral layers by the uh, nail bed. What does that mean? That means it's laying on material from the bottom side as that nail is growing out. That thickening rate has been determined to be 0.027 millimeters of thickness per millimeter of new length. So at the time that you cut a clipping at the distal edge, 20% of that total nail mass came from the underside as the nail is thickening as it grows out. Now I was testifying in a case uh, a year or so ago, and, and this, this came up and I had to produce this as evidence uh, of, of this fact. Um, they were claiming that a nail clipping represented the couple of weeks period of time that the nail spent in the uh, germinal matrix as it was being formed and then the six months later when you clip you have a two-week period of time from six weeks ago. And so I had to present this evidence to overcome that, that mythology. And so we've all heard of the uh, antifungal therapy drug called Lamisil. You see the little commercials on TV at night during ball games. And if you look at the structure here, uh, you know, uh, you guys are probably not familiar with the structures that we look at, but you know, this is just another drug. There's rings, there's carbons, there's double bonds, there's triple bonds, and um, you know, it's just another drug compound. And this 
Uh, oral medication is, a, is an appeal, and once it gets into your blood, it penetrates into the keratinized tissue, and the concentration of this drug in your nail has to be above a certain concentration before it starts killing the, uh, the fungus in question. And so this is what they reported. And this was, this was a long time ago. This was back in 1990. So this has clearly been in the literature for a long time. No excuse for an expert not to have seen this data. And so as you can see, they gave this drug to the individuals for 28 days in a row. And on day seven, they began collecting nails, plasma, and stratum corneum. Stratum corneum is a, is a layer of the uh, skin. And as you can see, on day seven, they started seeing this drug show up in the fingernails. So how can that be? That's because as the drug erupts off the end of the nail, uh, a nail bed or the quick, it's picking up drug there. And when we clip it, we're seeing that um, drug that was laid down over the past seven days. And so this is the evidence, and this is what was presented. And so this is quite clear that drug is laid down by all four mechanisms uh, in a nail test. Now, this is the fun part. Let's compare uh, nail to hair. Um, one of the early studies looked at eight healthy African-American males. It was a 10-week inpatient study with a three-week washout, and they administered two drugs over a six-day period with them alternating each day. And so we had 75 milligrams per 70 kilograms uh, times three days, and then on the alternative day, 60 milligrams per 70 kilograms um, of coating. And then they started collecting hair and nails. Here's a lot of numbers here, so let's kind of work our way through this. So the left-hand column, get my arrow back. The left-hand column are your subjects, so subject A through subject N. And the second column is the maximum concentration of cocaine that we found in the hair of these African-American males. The third column is the maximum concentration of cocaine that we found in their fingernails. The column on the far right is the ratio of the nail concentration to the hair concentration. Now, if you look at these at face value, you would say, oh my god, look how much lower the concentration of nail, concent of nail is compared to hair. There's no way that we can use the same cutoffs for hair testing. The piece that is not really discussed in the paper is the fact that these subjects were all African Americans. And African American hair is an ideal specimen type for detecting alkaline compounds in their hair. The hair is dark, it's coarser, it's curlier, which means it's got a little, little more porous action going. And so it's an ideal specimen type for the detection of cocaine. Um, nail has no pigment, so the hair color and the thickness and all of that is not an equation. It's not in the equation. When we move on to coating, same thing, but even more. Um, 5,900 down to 1,800 for the hair, and the nail concentrations range from 120 to 310. All of these are less than 10% of nail concentration in the hair. So one at first glance would say, hey, we need to perhaps consider different cutoffs for nail uh, uh, instead of, of hair. And here's a convenient table that I made to show the averages uh, from the previous two slides. So the hair concentration mean was 6,100, the nail for, for cocaine. The nail mean was 850, or 14%. And for coating, we had 3,200 uh, picograms in, in the hair and 180 um, in the nail, which is 6%. Again, at first glance, one would perhaps assume we need a different cutoff for fingernail. But you remember the previous study that we talked about before we got into this study, where we looked at coating concentrations versus hair color. And 
and you refresh your memory, here was the concentrations that we found for each hair color. And these were not identical uh, doses of codeine, but they were very similar. When we look at the nail concentrations from the most recent study I showed you, 180. Now, what jumps out to me is that by using fingernail, we have now normalized all of your hair tests to between somewhere between a disorder blonde and a brown. And to me, this is this is important because, in my opinion, this makes this a more fair of a test. This way, people with really dark hair um, aren't being called positive for doing the same amount that a redhead would be called negative for. And so it normalizes for the absence of the pigment. Here's some other studies by Henderson and another paper in JPET back in 2005 where we had different studies um, using similar uh, doses of cocaine and we had black mixed race uh, with 1,100 picograms of hair, uh, brown hair at 390, and then another study. This was less of a dose, but over three days uh, for African Americans, uh, 2,997, and their nail results were 850. And so that kind of gives you sort of an idea of where you can expect the nail results to fall in relative to the hair and the hair color. Now, that's a big variable when it comes to uh, testing for alkaline compounds. Again, the amphetamines, which includes methamphetamine, ecstasy, the opiates, the PCP, um, and a lot of the other compounds that we look for in our 17th panel. This phenomenon, or this observation, does not apply to acidic drugs. The most prevalent acidic drug that we look for is marijuana. Uh, Carboxy-THC is slightly acidic. And so the interaction between an acidic drug and the melanin is non-existent. And that's been demonstrated in, in many studies. So for marijuana, hair color is not a variable. And so we were able to look at a comparison of hair and nail uh, from remnants of a larger study. We had 22 matched hair and nail specimens. These are all from college students at a university in the Midwest. And what we found was quite fascinating in that in, in these uh, matched pairs, we had five times a higher concentration of carboxy THC in nail than in hair. And we've all struggled with the fact that hair testing uh, can be a challenge when it comes to marijuana sensitivity. And so because of the additional thickness of the fingernail, it's preserving more of the carboxy THC and the effect uh, of hair color is, is is equal on both sides. There is no color in the nail. Um, the thickness really takes charge. And, you know, we found 4,662 femtograms per milligram, or 4.6 picograms. And uh, uh, for the hair, we found 0.8 picograms, or, or 844 femtograms. Um, and so this was, this was quite eye-opening and uh, a significant advantage of testing nail we'll definitely be able to pick up more uh, marijuana users using fingernail. Another slightly acidic compound is ethyl glucuronide. And there's a large NIAAA, that's the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Large study, 529 matched pairs. Again, college students from Midwest. Um, and we looked at ETG uh, in their hair and fingernail. And again, we saw 2.5 times higher the concentration of ETG in the nail than in the hair. And one thing that we realized from the hair ETG, because we had more samples, is that the, uh, the female concentrations were much lower than the male concentrations, regardless of how much they self-reported that they drank. And we made the assumption, and again, more studies have to be done, uh, that the cosmetic treatment, the higher probability of cosmetic treatment of the females in that study resulted in, um, in a skewing of the results for female ETG. Of course, we don't bleach permanent eye or fingernails, so that was no effect. We did not see a gender difference uh, with the fingernail. 
Again, the thickness of the fingernail is four times thicker than a hair. Once it's incorporated, it's protected for a longer period of time. So this is quite exciting for two compounds that are very difficult to detect in hair. Uh, fingernails seem to offer an advantage. So that is, we've come to the end of our presentation today. Um, I hope that you learned a few nuggets uh, that will be helpful for your practice. Um, and nail testing has been around for a long time. There's not many people out there pushing it as a viable alternative uh, specimen, but rest assured is, uh, uh, there's literature going back to the 70s on nail testing. Um, obviously there's not as much literature, but it's definitely out there. Uh, nail testing offers a slightly longer window of detection. Um, the time it takes from the nail, and I should have covered this previously, the time that it takes for a nail to migrate from the uh, germinal matrix to the distal edge is four to six months, depending on the health of the individual. And so when you make a clipping, you're getting a representation of that entire trip down the nail bed. So longer detection window for the drugs of abuse. is still three months for ETG. Uh, difficult to adulterate. Uh, we have not encountered uh, any uh, adulterant that uh, will actively destroy drug in fingernail. And I'm sure as soon as I say that, one will come up this afternoon in the lab. Um, but, but at this time, the only problem that we have encountered are the um, uh, gels and polishes, et cetera. Uh, they don't interfere with the test, but they add weight to the specimen. And we analyze by weight. So if we're weighing out gel instead of fingernail, then that's going to uh, reduce your value accordingly. Uh, so that's why we ask for all the cosmetic treatment to the nail to be removed. And that's so that when we weigh it at the lab, we're only weighing the nail material and not some other stuff. It's not invasive. You don't have to worry about gender at collection. It's a direct observed collection. Um, and, and again, the color bias is a huge variable that's been removed. So we thank you for your patience today. And if we have any questions, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, will one-time drug use be detected in fingernail or hair testing? Uh, most likely not. Um, it's not likely to show up, but you know, single dose and when and all of that, if all the stars and moons align, uh, you will pick it up. Um, um, and, and so day in and day out, I would not expect a single dose or a single bench to show up in a hair or a nail. Okay. Will a hair or nail test determine how much or how often someone is using a drug? No. Anytime you're testing a reservoir matrix, a matrix where things tend to accumulate, it is extremely difficult to backtrack and determine time, dosage, and frequency. There's just too many variables. Uh, you've got uh, dose, timing, um, uh, personal uh, uh, genetics as far as metabolism, um, hygiene, uh, exposure to the elements, all of these are big variables and uh, backtracking to determine if someone's taking a prescription as, as, as prescribed or if they're abusing, you, you just can't do it. Okay, this, we've gotten this from a couple of people. Um, how does fingernail polish or polish remover affect nail testing? The polish remover should not affect it as long as it's not an ethanol-based polish remover. Uh, we don't have any studies showing that ethanol-based polish remover generate ETG, but when you've got a client sitting there and, they're, and you're smearing ethanol on their fingernails, that's going to be the first thing the defense attorney brings up. So do not use ethanol-based products in and around any of your hair collections or your fingernail collections if you're doing ETG testing. So that's number one. It's more of a perception than a reality issue. Number two, when it comes to the gels and the fingernail polish, it's more of a weight thing than a chemical reaction thing. So we want that material removed from the specimen so that when I weigh out 20 milligrams of specimen, I'm weighing out 20 milligrams of fingernail and not 12 milligrams of fingernail and 8 milligrams of nail polish. Okay, so now a couple questions about the chemical treatments or dyeing of hair. Um, if a client has received or has recently used a chemical treatment or dyed their hair, should I still proceed with the collection? 
that comes down to your court order if you're dealing with court orders. If you have the if you have the latitude to select a different specimen, then I would I would certainly recommend that. If you have a obviously cosmetically treated specimen hair, um, I would not collect it. A lot of you guys, uh, I fully understand, and I talk to you every day, where the judge will order a hair test and you have to deliver a hair test. You have no latitude. So um, mark it on the requisition form. Obviously bleached, obviously permed, obviously uh, uh, chemically straightened. And uh, that way it's documented at the time of collection that you observed this and were compelled to move forward. But if you can, I recommend either getting another hair uh, location or collecting the fingernail. Okay. How long after the hair has been dyed should my client wait for the hair collection? Well, the hair is going to grow at approximately a half inch a month. And so if you wait three months, then you can get a full specimen. A lot of times that's not practical. And so, you know, if you wait a month, you'll get a good month of data. Um, the catch-22 on these individuals is that from that point forward, they're actually loading more drug into the hair, so they may be actually harming themselves if they continue to use. But if you feel like uh, they were abstinent once they uh, abstinent once they uh, cosmetically treated the hair, um, you know, you may need to put another specimen type for those people. Does straightening the hair with a flat iron have the same effect on the sample? For some drugs, yes. Um, I've had a case with a child guard um, with a young child with very light colored hair, and um, uh, when the uh, 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 stepmother in this case would pick the child up from her mother's house, she would reek of meth lamp, and the child would say, mommy was doing this and mommy was doing that. And she would carry her home, she'd bathe the child, and she would straighten her hair. The child had um, a very you know, disheveled hair when she'd pick her up on Monday morning. And once she cleaned her up and straightened her hair, she would carry it out for hair collection. And invariably, the kid's hair would come out negative, and everyone was shaking their head. Once the story was revealed of what was going on, I recommended to the stepmom's um, attorney, don't clean the kid up. As soon as you pick the kid up Monday morning, carry her down to the collection site, collect the hair, and let's, let's collect the hair at that point. And that time, boom, a meth amp showed up. Methamp is one of the more volatile drugs that we deal with, and we have to be aware that uh, uh, treating the hair with a flat iron can dissipate some of that uh, methamphetamine from the hair. ETG is another compound that can be heat sensitive. Uh, there's been some recent papers uh, that show that the results can be affected. But again, with the heat treatment, you damage the hair, you open the pores. From that point forward, you load more hair in, but any drug that's in there it facilitates it being washed out with the next washer. What is the soonest that you will detect a drug use in a hair sample? And is there a difference in the window of detection between body hair and head hair and where the body hair is located? That's actually a good question. I know, but it was all the same. Okay. All right. So question one was? When's the soonest you will detect drug use in a hair sample? drug use. Okay, environmental exposure is going to be immediate, but that's not use. The drug from the sweat and the oil from the scalp can be detected within hours following the dose. And it's not likely that you're going to see that, but if you're doing some very high sensitivity type testing, um, which is not a routine test, um, say for instance a drug facilitated uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, you will see those drugs showing up within a few hours um, from the sweat and the oil. But then, as we mentioned earlier, single doses are not going to show up in a standard drug test or are not likely to show up in a standard drug test. So you kind of can't answer that question. What was the second part? Um, what is the difference between collecting body hair and head hair, the window of detection? Yeah, uh, head hair, uh, most of that hair is in a constant state of growth. And so when you go to the back of the head, and collect the sampling of hair um, and cut it at an inch and a half, the vast majority of that hair is going to be three months of age. And so that is the, the timeline that's establishing detection window. Body hair, depending on the section of the body, 
grows out to a certain length and goes dormant. And when you collect a sample of body hair, you know, it could still be growing or the or or in this case the majority of it will be dormant. And it can be dormant from anywhere from several weeks to several months to even up to a year. So when you're looking at body hair, say like pubic hair, some of that hair can be up to a year old. Um, so we have to be aware of that. Doesn't mean that it's going to be detecting a year, but it could go up to a year. Facial hair uh, should be considered as body hair because that growth pattern is not like the growth pattern on the uh, from the back of the scalp. And the third question? You covered it. I covered it. Okay. Taking care of. Um, do any of the shampoo adulterants work? I have not come across any of them that work. And can we detect the presence of an adulterant? Not at this time, no. Would multiple bleaching or chemical treatments of a hair sample potentially reduce drug levels to below the normal cutoff level? Yes. Does excessive hand washing and or ETOH based hand sanitizers affect nail testing? The ETOH based hand sanitizers, no. And the excessive hand washing, don't know. Don't think so. No evidence to show it. Why might my client who admitted to taking a specific drug receive a negative hair or nail test? Number one, check your profile and make sure that the profile that you ordered included the drug that you're looking for. Number two, single doses or single binges don't guarantee a positive result. Uh, and number three, uh, in the case of hair testing, um, you could be looking at an issue with co cosmetic treatment of the hair. And maybe they're just not doing enough to be above the cutoff. That could be another thing. If a client comes in with no hair and nails cut to the quick, when can we bring them back in for more nail testing? You can wait approximately two to three weeks to get a good sampling of fingernails. Is there a price difference? How much more expensive or is it cheaper for hair testing versus nail testing? Hair and nail testing are the same price, right Jenny? Correct. Yes. Same price. Can a nail test be used to prove a previously taken hair test that was inaccurate? In other words, if they come back negative on a hair test and then come back positive on a nail test, can they be used? Any second collected specimen does not refute the results of any first collected specimen. Number one, you have no idea what the individual did between time A and time B. And number two, um, you're looking at two different sample types and each sample type Although they are very similar, they do have different detection windows, thresholds to positivity, and advantages and disadvantages. So each sample stands on its own two feet. If this one's negative, congratulations, you're negative. If this was positive, do you have a reasonable explanation for the positive? But neither one refute each other. And um, you add the results together. As opposed to if you have a test that you can prove that the chain of custody was broken. Now, if you prove that the chain of custody for sample number one was broken, um, then that test doesn't exist at all. So you're really not refuting anything. That test shouldn't even exist anyway. It's removed from the record, and the results for sample two, this one should be considered. Does a, condi does a condition like psoriasis or diabetes affect the fingernail testing? It can. Uh, psoriasis, the nails can grow very rapidly so you might get a much shorter um, detection window because the clippings are much younger than say uh, someone of normal der normal dermal health. Also there there are a list of, uh, of, of, of health conditions that affect the growth rate of the nail. Um, there's differences uh, uh, in terms of pregnancy and diabetes and uh, uh, poor heart health uh, etc. And there are certain drugs that make your nails grow slower or faster. And so all of these do uh, uh, have to be considered when interpreting a nail test. 
If we send in a hair sample to the lab that is 20 inches long, does that mean that the window of detection will be 40 months? No. At the laboratory, our standard operating procedure instructs us to identify the root end and then cut it at an inch and a half from the root end. We discard the excess length. Um, we, at our laboratory, only analyze the first inch and a half closest to the scalp. Could casual physical contact with a drug cause a positive result for hair or fingernail testing? Yes. What is a simple way to explain why fingernail test has two different testing periods for drugs versus alcohol? Good question. Um, ETG is very different from the other um, drugs or analytes that we look for. ETG is extremely water soluble. So while it is being protected uh, by the thickness of the nail, because the hands are exposed uh, to a lot of water each day, um, it does apparently wash out. The data that we have at this time show that, uh, that ETG is not sticking around four to six months like we see for a lot of other drugs uh, 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 reported in the literature. Uh, it seems that about three months is as far back as ETG goes in fingernail. Um, again, it has to do with water solubility and you're washing your hands, you're taking a bath, you have your hands in water, uh, ETG is being literally extracted out of the nail material over time. With chemically treated hair, do any of the colors affect the test more than others? For example, bleaching your hair blonde versus dyeing your hair black? Uh, it's all over the place and unpredictable. Just cosmetic treatment, don't go there, and then you'll be safe. What is the requirement to collect hair or nail samples? Is there any kind of certification or training required? We have uh, training resources um, available on our website, and you can also uh, contact client services uh, to receive training material, but it is optional. And uh, there is no requirement for certification, but I certainly do encourage you uh, to uh, request um, a link to our training materials and take the quiz and get your certificate. That way when you're uh, testifying about the collection in your local court cases, you can show that at least that you have been through um, our, you know, you are providing the specimen that we expect here in the laboratory. All right, Joe, I believe that's all the time we have for questions today. Excellent. Um, please feel free to contact us at Forensic Testing at usdtl.com. For any questions that you didn't have answered, we'll go ahead and respond to those that we didn't have time for today as well individually. Um, or if you'd like to take the certifica certification test that Joe was talking about. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for being here. And the recording will be available at usdtl.com in one week.